Throughout their history, Square was a company who were at the forefront of video gaming. They weren't afraid to push boundaries and were often quick to adapt to changes in the landscape, something that allowed them to retain their competitive edge. This was evidenced numerous times in the decades that followed the establishment of Square, and one of the first instances came back in 1986. Square was established with the goal of creating high-end video games for personal computers. They believed home consoles, such as the Famicom, were nothing more than kids' toys, and as creators, felt those pieces of hardware were somewhat beneath them. But after being impressed by hardware sales, they decided to port Thexter to the Famicom to test the waters and such were the results that they were convinced to flush their values down the toilet and sign a contract with Nintendo that would see them develop exclusively for the Famicom. Ten years later, Square then shocked Japan by announcing that they would sever ties with Nintendo and develop instead for the PlayStation, as they didn't feel as though the Nintendo 64 was powerful enough for them to deliver the types of games they wanted. Square informed Nintendo of their decision in a meeting with Hiroshi Yamauchi, the then president and CEO of Nintendo, and on the surface, he wished them all the best. But behind the scenes, Nintendo was said to be livid, not least because Square had also convinced Enix to abandon Nintendo as well. In the years that followed, such was the bitterness between the two companies that Square employees were banned from the Nintendo offices, and it got to the point that Yamauchi launched an acrimonious tirade against the company, stating in an interview that people who play RPGs are depressed gamers who like to sit alone in their dark rooms. It felt like there would be no resolution, that no games developed or published by Square would ever again appear on a Nintendo system, but after a catastrophic turn of events at Square, bridges ended up being rebuilt and a deal was struck that would see them produce a brand new Final Fantasy experience for the Nintendo GameCube that would end up being like nothing ever seen before within the franchise. This is the history of Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles. In the years that followed Square's decision to side with Sony, they were flying high. Final Fantasy VII, 8 and 9 had been huge hits, and they were supported by other titles such as Parasite Eve, Xenogears and Chrono Cross. Many of these games featured high quality computer graphic sequences thanks to the efforts of two brand new subsidiaries, Square USA and Square Pictures, and such was the quality of their output that senior figures at the company felt comfortable expanding the remit of Square Pictures so that they could attempt to muscle in on the vast riches that Hollywood offered. But despite all of their successes within the realm of video games, and even partnering up with Columbia Pictures, who were coincidentally owned by Sony, Square were out of their depth when it came to making feature-length movies. By the end of production, this lack of experience showed, and it led to the spirits within costing Square $137 million to produce. This was more than the likes of Planet of the Apes, The Mummy Returns, Monsters Inc and Shrek, and was over four times the budget they had assigned for the development of Final Fantasy X. Based on the Hollywood rule of thumb, it was estimated that the movie would need to generate around $380 million to be profitable, but by the end of its run in movie theatres, The Spirits Within had only generated $85 million. The initial outlay and subsequent failure to recoup anywhere near what was required crippled Square from a financial perspective and in the year before The Spirits Within had even released, it meant Square had posted losses for the first time since becoming a public company. To try and stop the initial decline, Tomoyuki Takachi was promoted from his position as president and CEO to chairman. In his manifesto, he outlined the steps that would see Square follow up their initial losses with a $6 million profit the following year, but he resigned just eight months later and left Square as the forecasted profit was expected to turn into a loss of $115 million. As a consequence of this catastrophic failure, Takachi was not alone in taking the blame. Masahi Hiromatsu, who had assumed the role of CEO after Takachi's promotion, also resigned from his position, but he was reinstated as an executive director. Hironobu Sakaguchi, who had rolled the dice many times before and won, resigned too from his position as vice president and was reinstated as an executive producer. And Hisashi Suzuki, who had assumed the role of president, managed to retain his position but agreed to take a 50% pay cut. To try and address the rot, Square was forced to look for additional revenue streams. 
It saw them start porting older Final Fantasy games to the Wonderswan, and they also spoke of their desire to create a brand new franchise that could surpass and reduce reliance on Final Fantasy, something they had been trying to do for years with minimal success. But deep down, they knew that Final Fantasy was still their golden ticket, and they also knew that the Game Boy Advance would eclipse the Wonderswan in terms of both hardware capabilities and install base. And so, in the build-up to the release of the Game Boy Advance, Sakaguchi spoke at a meeting with business analysts about their desire to release remakes of Final Fantasy IV, V, and VI on the Game Boy Advance instead of the Wonderswan. With their tail between their legs, Square then attempted to obtain a license to develop for the Game Boy Advance, but Yamauchi, who was still bitter about Square's previous actions, rejected the request and instead issued them an ultimatum. This ultimatum would see Square need to commit to not only developing unique properties for the Game Boy Advance, but to ensure there was due recompense for their decision to snob the Nintendo 64, Yamauchi made Square also commit to supporting Nintendo's next console, the GameCube. This second objective threw a spanner in the works. As to try and raise more capital, Square had just sold a 19% stake of the company to Sony, and after hearing of Square's plans, Sony then naturally sought assurances from Square that if they were to enter into an agreement with Nintendo, that there would need to be no impact on its development of titles for the PlayStation 2. To ensure that all parties were satisfied, Square reassigned resources from their Wonderswan projects, purchased Quest, and established a new internal production group, and contracted Brownie Brown, a newly formed development studio which consisted of numerous ex-Square employees who had just left after realising they had different ideals. These teams were set to work on games for the Game Boy Advance, like Chocobo Land, Final Fantasy Tactics Advance, and Sword of Mana. But to service the second requirement, Square formed a brand new company that was independent of Sony so that there would be suitable separation. This was called the Game Designer Studio, and Square would retain a 49% stake, with the remaining 51% stake assigned to Akitoshi Kawazu, a board member of Square and then leader of Square's second production unit. It was disclosed that this would be nothing more than a paper company, with the actual development of any properties being done by Kawazu's production unit, but this separation was deemed acceptable by both Sony and Nintendo. Yamauchi even chose to help fund the first major initiative of the game designer studio via his Q fund, but there was another catch. If Square chose to accept the money from Yamauchi, they would need to not only ship the game in the following year, but they would also need to promise to create a Final Fantasy game that was unlike anything seen before in the franchise. It was a tall order, not least because the developers would need to learn how to use brand new technology, but that had never stopped them before, and deep within Square there was a culture of experimentation and rising to meet new challenges head on. To assist in this endeavour, Kazuhiko Aoki was assigned as the director, and he brought with him a wealth of experience, having joined Square around the same time as Kawazu. But despite both being at the company for so long, and both having worked on the Final Fantasy franchise, they had never worked together on a project before. It meant there was an interesting blend of styles, as they had both been known for pushing boundaries with their game design and storytelling, and together they worked with a small group of staff to try and figure out how they could show Nintendo their commitment to this new agreement. In order to hit that first point about shipping the following year, the team leveraged the new connection with Nintendo to pick the brains of people like Shigeru Miyamoto so that they could get up to speed with how best to take advantage of the new hardware. They also decided that all cinematics would be done in real time using the in-game engine, and that the story would be much more condensed compared to the likes of the traditional numbered Final Fantasy title. It was for this reason that they decided to use the name Crystal Chronicles, as they felt the experience was far too different to be considered a main numbered instalment, and the long-term plan was that after it was established, they would try to ditch the Final Fantasy name in order to create a brand new franchise, like they had done with the Mana franchise a decade before. To hit the second point of creating a Final Fantasy game unlike anything seen before, they felt the best way would be to make Crystal Chronicles a multiplayer experience that could somehow leverage both the Game Boy Advance and the GameCube at the same time. But the challenge was that nothing like this had ever been done before by any developer anywhere in the world, and when the concept was announced to the general public with no context or detail, there was perplexion amongst the gaming community. Nonetheless, with the end goal in mind, the development team started to deliberate how this concept could be best executed. 
But in an initial sense, from the outset, Kawazu wanted to make sure the development team did not feel constrained by this new game being part of the Final Fantasy franchise. There would be elements, such as Moogles, that would ensure it tied in with the overarching franchise, but there was no obligation to include things like specific job classes or anything like that. Instead, the main principle Kawazu wanted to convey was that the game should give players a sense of freedom to explore and express themselves. For that reason, they also resolved to create an experience that could be enjoyed by all ages and hoped that parents would be encouraged to play the game with their children. In early development, it was assumed that they would be using the very familiar active time battle system. This had been used for every main numbered Final Fantasy game since Final Fantasy IV and Aoki had been one of the designers who helped with its creation. They felt this would allow for a lot of cooperation as each player would control a unique character in the party and this mechanic had been explored in Final Fantasy V, VI and IX, but they felt they could push it much further by using the Game Boy Advance to display a lot of tactical information and by having it also house the UI, players could plan out detailed strategies. This would allow for a lot of creative freedom, as by having each player use a separate Game Boy Advance, their actions would be hidden from the other players. The results would then appear on the big screen via the GameCube when it was their turn, and it would make the whole experience much more organic and cooperative, much like role-playing in something like Dungeons & Dragons, which was a huge inspiration for Kawazu when he created the original gameplay systems for Final Fantasy on the NES. It sounded great in theory, but in practice, they found the experience was far too jarring as players would need to keep looking back and forth between the two screens to keep up with the action. Upon realising this, Kawazu became quite worried as they were on a very tight deadline, and after they killed off the concept, they had no clue what they were going to do with the Game Boy Advance side of the game. But the answer was right in front of them. As work had wrapped up on projects like Final Fantasy IX, X and The Bouncer, artists and planners such as Yasuhisa Izumisawa, Kenzo Kanzaki and Kimonori Ono were able to join the team. Toshiyuki Itahana, who was initially working on Final Fantasy XII, even requested to transfer over to work on Crystal Chronicles as he was intrigued by what they were creating. It meant they had a wealth of experience in character, monster and field design, so while some members of the development staff were attempting to figure out a solution to how the consoles would link together, others made a lot of progress with establishing the core visuals and wider design elements. And after seeing what they had pulled together, the team decided their best option would be to continue focusing their efforts on the big screen portion of the game, and this meant the Game Boy Advance would then be used to enhance this experience as opposed to competing for its attention. This would see the Game Boy Advance continue to be used as a controller, but the screen would just house unique information that the player could either choose to share with the party or keep to themselves, and it would not require a lot of focus. For example, one person could be assigned as the Scouter, and they would be able to provide enemy strengths and weaknesses, while another would be given access to the map. With this decision made, the team was then free to focus on building out other elements, and this saw plenty of innovation brought to the fore. Around the same time, Square was also working on their first MMO, Final Fantasy XI. This would have a strong focus on multiplayer, albeit on a much larger scale, but to achieve this, they developed a new gameplay system that they called Real Time Battle. As they moved away from the idea of using a turn based system, Crystal Chronicles was developed with a similar premise, and Aoki pushed Yuichi Tsuchiya, the main battle planner, to take things further by allowing players and enemies to attack in real time. This was a significant first for the Final Fantasy franchise, but the gameplay also featured plenty of other nuances, such as timing requirements around offensive and defensive play. Physical attacks could be charged and combined, and enemy attacks could also be blocked in real time. Spells could even be fused together if the players were well coordinated, and this would create powerful spells like Holy Ra and Clearagar, which had never been seen before in any prior game in the franchise. When combined with the unique information cycling around after each dungeon and magic not being retained, each player could then end up playing in a different way from one dungeon to the next, and this helped to build out a comprehensive multiplayer experience that would encourage conversation and cooperation as players would need to communicate in order to succeed. This all worked well with their wider vision, but they came up against a hurdle when they attempted to figure out how to give players freedom of movement, while also restricting them to a single screen. They had considered splitting the screen into four, but they came to the realisation that this would lead to a huge disconnect, as you might end up with a situation where every player wanted to just do their own thing. To help solve this, they created the notion of Miasma. 
From a narrative perspective, this was a dangerous substance that could be found throughout the world, but from a gameplay perspective, it was created so that players would be forced to stick together. Miasma could be repelled by myrrh, but the crystal chalice, which players had to carry around with them at all times, only had limited range, and if players went outside of that range, they would be penalised. It meant they created restrictions without inhibiting the sense of freedom, as if players worked well together, they could move at a pretty decent pace and explore the world with ease. Aoki was also keen to give a similar sense of freedom to the story. Unlike the typical single player experiences in the franchise, where players would be invested in a rich narrative, Due to the nature of Crystal Chronicles' multiplayer experience and the demographics they were trying to target, the story would need to be much easier to digest so that players could catch up pretty quickly after joining new sessions and children could also understand it. To help, Aoki created letters and diaries, but he also made sure the game's environments had plenty of personality and atmosphere. This would reward players who wanted to delve a little bit deeper into the mythology but wouldn't penalise those who just wanted to enjoy the gameplay experience. The same care was also placed around building ambience through the use of audio. Kumi Tanioka was selected as the composer after producing an impressive body of work on Final Fantasy XI, and she managed to blend together traditional Final Fantasy themes with her own unique style. As the narrative was sparse and there wasn't a main cast of characters in the traditional sense, Tanioka used illustrations of the game's world as her inspiration. She wanted the music to feel inclusive and not limited to a single country or culture, and working hand in hand with Hidenori Iwasaki, the synthesizer operator, they crafted something they felt would resonate with audiences all around the world. Each individual location received a certain flair, with different instruments, tones and rhythms presented throughout, and this helped to add an extra layer to the atmosphere that was created by the visuals and the tense gameplay. By the end of production, the team felt they had achieved their initial objectives, the game would ship in the year following its announcement, and they created something that was unlike any prior Final Fantasy experience. But beyond that, they just believed Crystal Chronicles was a game that would resonate with players from all walks of life, as they had personally had so much fun making it and playing it themselves. They just hoped that there would be enough content housed within that would appeal to existing fans of the Final Fantasy franchise, and that as a standalone action RPG, it would be compelling enough to draw new players in. When it launched in Japan on the 8th of August 2003, they must have been so pleased to see their efforts resonate with an expectant fanbase. Crystal Chronicles achieved the best first week sales on the GameCube of any non-Nintendo developed property, console sales were boosted, and famed Japanese publication Famitsu commended the game for its fairy tale esque visuals and unconventional treatment of the RPG genre. Later that year, Crystal Chronicles even won the grand prize at the Japan Media Arts Festival as the judges were very impressed with the quality of the worksmanship and the innovation of the impressive multiplayer mode. This was all very positive news, but there was a downside that started to become apparent. As a standalone single player application, Crystal Chronicles was not the best, and although it excelled when playing with friends, to create that scenario would need a significant financial outlay and a good network. You would need to have four friends who were close by, and they would each need to have a Game Boy Advance along with a Game Boy Advance link cable. And then, you would need to make sure that everyone was available to play at the same time through the 20-30 to 30 hour campaign. Still, when the game was released in North America and Europe, plenty of gamers were willing to explore Crystal Chronicles, and it ended up selling approximately 1.3 million copies worldwide. Compared to a typical Final Fantasy release, this was quite poor, but given the low install base of the GameCube and its nature as a spin-off, it was very respectable, and Crystal Chronicles ended up as the 20th best-selling game on the GameCube. This was enough to convince Square Enix that Crystal Chronicles was viable for expansion, but this expansion came as a sub-franchise of Final Fantasy as opposed to a standalone offering. And as the objectives of Square Enix changed yet again in the following years, Crystal Chronicles, despite its impressive debut, ended up becoming exploited and oversaturated. But that's a story for another time. Whether you played the original Crystal Chronicles with that optimum setup or had to try and tough it out alone, I think we can all agree that it was a very unique experience, and the story of its creation is a rather fascinating one. Personally, I've always had a lot of reverence for this game, as I was fortunate enough that three of my housemates at university just happened to each have a Game Boy Advance and a link cable, and we had an absolute blast playing through the game together. 
And if Kazuhiko Aoki just happens to be watching this video, or if anyone at Square Enix is and they feel like passing along on the message, we all adored the letter mechanic as the male Moogle is just so darned cute and Kumi Tanioka's adaptation of the theme song works so well. When Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles Remastered releases on the 27th of August, here's hoping that a whole new generation will get to experience what I did in my younger days. If you'd like to watch me reliving my youth, this time with Lauren alongside me, then please feel free to follow us on Twitch at Lozadar. There's a link in the description below. We should be playing through the entire game upon release, and it promises to be a blast. Either way, we hope you enjoyed this trip down memory lane. Please be sure to let us know your thoughts about Crystal Chronicles in the comments below. And if you enjoyed this video, then please do hit that like button and hit the bell so you get notified immediately when we publish new content. All right, guys, this is Daryl signing out. I'd like to extend a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters. And of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.